We're going to actually, uh, we'll take a break. We'll come back. I, we're going to be joined by a guest who, Scott Ryan, he's written a book called The Last Decade of Cinema, which goes deep dive into 90s cinema, which uh, I think may be underrated. 80s certainly has its own uh popularity and love the 2000s through the 2020s has been explosive blockbuster movies but where is the art of cinema nowadays we'll talk with our guest scott ryan when we return right here in for henry lake i'm dave schrader on news talk 830 wcco everybody thank you for tuning in and spending a little time henry lake is at the timberwolves game sitting in i'm dave schrader scott ryan joins us now a pop culture historian and expert on the entertainment industry he's going to turn back the clocks for us to the 1990s as he does in his latest work the last decade of cinema it analyzes iconic movies from the 90s unpacking their cultural impact and lasting legacy and uh scott thank you so much for joining us today Oh, thanks for having me. I haven't had this much fun since I attended the Bluey Con at Las Vegas. <laughs> Man, I'm sorry to hear that for you. That is <laughs> must have been very, very disappointing. But, uh, you know, we, we were chatting off air, uh, Charlie and I, about movies and obviously my love of the 80s movies, even some of the 70s, and and kind of realizing that the heart for me started to taper in the 90s in into the early 2000s and then it seems once we we kind of hit the 2000s mid 2000s everything just became a recycled bunch of flashbang boom cgi effects and we lost the heart of cinema so when i saw your book and i saw this i knew i wanted to chat with somebody that could kind of maybe enlighten us in on this and, and give us some insight as to where where did we go wrong in the world of filmmaking after the end of the 1990s yeah, I mean, that is exactly what sent me on this quest to figure that out. Um, you know, you were talking earlier about the Brat Pack and the 80s movies, and yeah. 80s movies are great, but they are all, every 80s movie has a happy ending and has a moral victory. That was the key to the 80s. In the 90s, Something really crazy happened, which was you could do anything you wanted. And I sort of say it was Quentin Tarantino and Pulp Fiction that sort of cracked the movie industry and allowed the bad guy to win, if you can imagine such a thing. Yeah, and on the John Schuster Coldwell Banker hotline, we have our guest Scott Ryan. Uh, his book is called The Last Decade of Cinema. I couldn't agree with you more. That is an interesting element of it, right? But that was the rule of the, the villain winning was taken away very early on when the, the movie ratings, uh, they, they were, they felt they were celebrating the gangsters in the 30s and 40s and kind of put that in place to where the gangsters couldn't win. They couldn't live. They couldn't survive. So there had to be a clean, tidy, the government wins kind of thing. But when you come into the 70s, I mean, you've got movies like The Godfather. Those were not real feel-good movies. And there were some standouts, The Deer Hunter and and some others that I can think of that don't necessarily fit that parameter. But you're right. The 80s kind of encapsulated that newer... I guess robust everything's happy and we can wrap it up in a in a 2 hour bubble kind of vibe and and then bringing us back into that is the Quentin Tarantino era of allowing us to see different sides of stories that maybe had been played out before but seeing it from a different perspective. Yes, I mean and I address the 70s in my book because, of course, that's what people are going to point to. But the point that I make in my book was that if you had a graph of the technology of film on one side and on the other side you had storytelling, I believe that the apex of that graph would be the 90s. So I'm not saying in my book that there weren't great films in the 70s. Of course there was. But the technology, like, you know, the lighting isn't the greatest. They don't have scores down as well as the scores of the 90s are. You know, in the 90s, there were some computer graphics. It wasn't all. But, you know, those movies, they hold up. Right. So you could show your kids uh, the Shawshank Redemption or Pretty Woman or Terminator 2 or the Cider House Rolls. 
Those are all 90s films, but they look good. If you show your kids something from the 70s, they're out of the room in a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are. Well, I learned <laughs> you know, that lesson the hard way with my favorite like movie. Yeah, with my favorite TV show growing up was the uh, uh, Land of the Lost. And I, I, I've told the story. I think it's funny. I went out and bought the DVD set when it came out. And I'm like, kids, you think Jurassic Park is cool? Check this out. And I sat down with my, my little pod of children, about four or five of us, and I popped it in, and I don't think we made it past the first 15 minutes of episode one, and slowly each child just stood up and shook their head as they walked into another room to get away from me and this debacle of a TV program that I loved growing up, and you do realize just how dated a lot of our, our memories are regarding some of those classics. Definitely, and I mean, and that's so much of why George Lucas went back and re-edited Star Wars to keep it current and and other films have followed suit but in the 90s you didn't just have better special effects you had grown-up stories grown-up characters and every film wasn't made for everyone and that is what i try to focus on my book i i pick 25 major films to do long essays on and then 30 more in the back of the book but i didn't want to pick the same type of movie to show you that we had options where now if you're going to the movie theater today you're going to either see a remake or a sequel and and those are your choices right the the reboots which is a much better way of saying remake right because people are easily fooled by that title it is it's remarkable how lack of ingenuity hollywood seems to be showing every major film house I, I shouldn't say that there are a few that have taken a few stretches you've got Blumhouse and and some of these that have gone out and tried to examine different genres in a different way and and with varying success uh you know we've had the cookie cutter success of shows like um you know the the Marvel movies and Godzilla franchise and things and I know that 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 is not necessarily your wheelhouse to me as a nerd growing up you know from the 60s 70s 80s it's fun for me to see that all of the kids that I grew up with are now in charge of movie studios and I'm getting to see my childhood uh you know cartoons come to life in a in a new exciting way but it also was like, okay, good. We've, we've been there, done that. What can we do next? And it seems like that just continues as opposed to anything else that's being offered up to really kind of shake the paradigm of movie going experiences. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was a movie that your parents could see that a teenager could see, you know, in the nineties, you had movies like clueless and pump up the volume and she's all that. And 10 things I hate about you all made for teenagers, but they're good films. It wasn't just for teenagers. A grown up could watch it as well. There were older, you know, movies for women. There's uh, Fried Green Tomatoes is out there. There's Westerns with Unforgiven. And these all were at the cinema. This wasn't like you had to go find them. I've had a couple people tell me, well, there's options out there. But, you know, I got to subscribe to 47 uh, streaming services to get to them. Right. Back in my day, I could go to the video store and they were all there. It didn't matter to me if it was a universal picture or a Netflix picture. You know what I mean? In the video store, they were all side by side. Right. And I do miss, and I love the fact that you mentioned in in the write-ups, that arguing about films in a video store was our version of Twitter, right? And and there was passion and love behind it and people having those uh, existential conversations about what film was and what film should be. And you don't see that kind of uh, resonance anywhere anymore. Uh, people don't really have that great common bond of getting together to discuss these things. You, you know, we can tune in and, and check out our favorite uh, critic, but, you know, for my part, most critics, I think, fall short of what or who the movie was directed towards anyway. Right. And when you were in the video store and three of you went in, you know, you pick a movie, I pick a movie, he picks a movie, and we, you would defend your movie. You would say why you should see this, and you're convincing the other person. And they're like, you know what? Yeah. Yeah, let's get that one. And we were all friends. We didn't unfriend them. 
because they didn't want to see your movie. <laughs> um, it was all okay. I'm, I'm going to sit down and, and we're going to watch Reality Bites. I wanted to see singles, but I'll try your movie. And that happened in the video store. I mean, yeah. anyone our age remembers arguing with someone in the aisle of the video store trying to get them to get your movie. Right. And I, I listen, had I not had those exchanges, I would have missed out on the Boondock Saints, right? Which is one of my favorite mm-hmm. movies of all time now that came out in the 90s and kind of came and went without much uh, fanfare at the time. Run, Lola, Run, and so many other great movies. We do need to take a quick break. Our guest is online with us right now, Scott Ryan, and his book is called The Last Decade of Cinema on the John Schuster Coldwell Banker Hotline. I'm also keeping an eye on the stylesfinancial.com talk and text line. Weigh in. What are your thoughts on the movies of the 90s? Which generation got it right? What film stood out to you the most? We'll talk about that when we return. In for Henry Lake, I'm Dave Schrader. This is News Talk 830 WCCO. Joining me on the John Schuster Coldwell Banker Hotline, we have Scott Ryan, author of The Last Decade of Cinema. You know, I'm also reminded, uh, Scott, that the music of the 80s also is part of what made movies stand out to me so well. But as uh, Chris here in studio kept reminding me about 90s movies, and I'm like, wow, how could I have forgotten so many of these titles and the amazing music that came out of the 90s movies as well? Yeah, I mean, uh, Reality Bites. Um, High that Fidelity. Probably yeah. bigger than that. Singles, uh, Lost Highway, uh, Pulp Fiction, Pretty Woman. They all had huge soundtracks. Well, and then you get into the American Pie movies and Loser and so many of the other kind of iterations of that that also introduced us to a whole new great sound of music that that I think people often forget about until you hear it played on the radio again. Yeah, and they were songs that you could only get on that soundtrack. And part of the thing that I write, I do a chapter on Clueless, and I say there's a big scene in that movie where Jewel sings all by myself, and that's never come out anywhere. It's not on any of her albums, and, you know, that stuff drives me crazy, too. Let's release this stuff. Right, yeah, getting the music back out there and uh, getting the stories and, and the movies out there. However... I don't know if you've just seen this uh, insanity. They're remaking Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Is that really a movie that was screaming, we need to have a new version of this, Scott? Is that that really what was needed in 2024? Well, I mean, this is the problem. They don't want to put money into original ideas. One of the things I point out in my book is in 1994, the top 10 grossing films were all 10 original ideas, not a sequel, not an IP, not a superhero, not a comic book, 10 original ideas. In 2022, the top 10 were all sequels, IPs, or comic books. I mean, there's no originality. Have we? Is it just that that the networks on TV and the uh, large movie studios have they completely tapped the well of good ideas, or have they just gotten so skittish of taking a loss that instead of putting themselves out there to try to create something new and exciting, they'd rather just continue to put out cookie cutter versions of movies that have a, a successful IP. Well, I actually think that it is more fear-based that they don't want to offend anyone. And part of these movies were, they weren't, none of us thought they were offensive in the 90s, but they made you uncomfortable. Spike Lee, I do a chapter on Spike Lee, and he was all about making you so uncomfortable. Now, if there's anything uncomfortable, they're going to give you a trigger warning. They're going to tell you when it happens. They don't want you to be uncomfortable. And if you're not uncomfortable, you're not experienced humanity. You can't have a story 
that doesn't make you a little squeamish. That's Scott, not that how is, life works. That's perfect. You know what? That That's a great way to encapsulate that because there were movies that, listen, I grew up in a time when a lot of slang and derogatory terms were slung without any thought into what the word meant or who it right. was making a shot at. And it was in a lot of the movies that I had those moments of, Wow, that was, you know, to me, that was just a little throwaway line, and I didn't mean it in an offensive, homosexual way. But now I realize just how cold that came off, or just, and it didn't mean that I've become part of the woke culture, but I became much more aware of the things I say and to whom I say them. Because there is that element of being uncomfortable and, and having that mirror of kind of our contemporary existence put back up in front of us and it, it it can make you a better person it can make you step up and not only are you getting the entertainment value you're getting a lot of these different elements of it but but you're reminded that that these are people too going through their own versions of stories and it's not always just well, about uh, middle class white kids well I, a movie that i talk about with that is as good as it gets which you know came out right. in i think 97 Jack Nicholson's character is described as the worst human ever. Guess what? He's going to say racist things. He's going to say anti-Semitic things. He's going to say homophobic things. You know why? Because he's the worst person ever. And he learns as his life is widened, as he meets uh, a gay character in Greg Kinnear, uh, African American in Cuba Gooding Jr., and his world gets wider. And by the end of the movie, he's not that horrible. If you made that movie today, he would have to start out at that position. Otherwise, they would say the actor and director had those feelings. Not that they're trying to teach us that when you widen your world, you start to realize that racism is pointless. And there's so much to be learned from 90s movies because of that, because these characters do horrible things. And those are some of the things that I point out throughout the book. It, it is interesting, right? Uh, because I, I will sit down with my children and watch movies that I grew up loving from the 80s and 70s. And I will realize just how quickly I become uncomfortable with the scenarios, the uh, what's kind of the stereotypical way that... Uh, people are shown and presented and that it's not done in a way that educates or enlightens people to maybe what they're going through, but more embraces, oh, look, Asian people are horrible drivers. Women are, right. are gossipy. And, uh, right, it's, it's always just over the top versions of every character that was represented in these, in these different programs, which you know, there, there's something for being woke and being aware of the personalities that exist around us. But like you said, you know, you have to have a place and an understanding of the people that you're representing in the movies as well. Because if you don't start off at one place, you don't see the growth. You don't see how yeah, a and character there certainly can change. Were, I mean, there certainly were movies that were just bad and, you know, and, and portrayed characters in a really bad light but even those things and and those are not the kind of movies that i'm covering but if you go back in time of course but that's a good lesson for you to to see the growth obviously we wouldn't make that movie today but if you want to make a movie about gangsters today guess what they're going to be as horrible as the characters in goodfellas um, otherwise, they're not gangsters. Right. Then don't tell a story about gangsters. Tell a story about moral, upstanding, uh, perfect people. And it's just, then you're going to get the movies we have today. So you think a lot of it is just the fear mongering of being afraid to be the, the movie company that, uh, might offend somebody or might put somebody in the wrong light, uh, inadvertently. Well, I think because there's so much money involved, they don't, they, it's not worth their risk. One thing that just knocked my socks off in doing this book is the movie Menace to Society. And I was lucky enough to interview the writer, Tiger Williams, for the book as well. And we kind of went through it's a, it's a very provocative movie about inner city life in LA. 
Over the credits of New Line Cinema's logos are, you know, characters saying words that none of us are allowed to say anymore. And you just would not have a company would, would show their logo over using those words. But nobody was fact-checking that way. Nobody was thinking, well, that means New Line Cinema is for these words. They understood that was life in L.A. at that in 1993. And that disconnect is what's missing from art now, is that it's just art. It's not real life. Let's go after the people really saying it in real life and really doing harm to us, not characters in a movie theater. We, we need to take it our last break together. Uh, when we come back, though, Scott, what are some of the movies you think are doing it right? What are some of the, the movie companies that are taking those chances now and giving us our best opportunity at seeing through the proper lenses instead of uh, sugar-coated, uh, whitewashed, or, um, I guess, nostalgic lenses? What can we look at? We'll do that and more with our guest, Scott Ryan, author of The Last Decade of Cinema, right here on the John Schuster Coldwell Banker Hotline, when we return to News Talk 830 WCCO. In for Henry Lake, this is Dave Schrader on News Talk 830 WCCO. Remember, tune in tomorrow for our Cure Blood Cancer radio auction that'll be taking place throughout the day tomorrow right here on News Talk 830 WCCO. And joining me right now on the John Schuster Caldwell Banker Hotline, we have Scott Ryan. Scott, before the break, I asked you what what movies and what uh, production companies or, or big budget movie companies are stepping up and starting to try to fill that void right now, or are you seeing a lack of that still? Well, I've been sweating that whole commercial because I was like, I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer. And um, I mean, from my vantage point, no one is. I think television is what has replaced that. You know, there are television shows that that is where quality character development has moved to. That's just sort of the new way. You know, in, uh, and back in the 90s and before that, you went to the movie theater to fall in love with characters. And now you watch television shows. You know, there's shows like Reservation Dogs and Hacks and Atlanta. And there are shows out there that have honest-to-goodness character development, which is what I want as a writer. I want to feel for this person and and learn from them. I don't think there's an, I don't think movies have done it for years and years. Do you think that it's partly due to the fact that there is the death of the celebrity? I mean, the the concept of celebrity, right, in the all the way from the thirties all the way till even into the very early 2000s, there were still celebrities. There were the Julia Roberts, the George Clooney's, the Brad Pitt's, the, you know, the Molly Ringwalds and Emilio Estevez and, and Lou Diamond Phillips and Kiefer Sutherland's who they, they were kind of the big celebrities. Now there seems to be, there's TV, there's YouTube stars, there's TikTok stars, there's, and a lot of these social media stars are bigger with larger followings than some of our biggest movie and TV stars are. Do you think that part of this is that dehumanization? I mean, I don't know that there's an opportunity for someone to step up. There's certainly great actors still. But, you know, celebrity is such a strange word now. Like, we're all celebrities on our own Facebook page. So do we even really care in that way? So I think that the culture has sort of changed. You know, in doing this book, I couldn't believe how many movies Brad Pitt was in in the 90s. And he always played a completely different character. It wasn't right. seeing the same thing over. He loses himself in these characters. And there are character actors out there, but is there a Gene Hackman out there? I mean, or a Charles Durning? I mean, I, I'm not sure that these people get the chance. Maybe a Paul Giamatti. Maybe you've got a few of the people like right. that, that that kind of fit that bill and can play many different roles. Uh, and and for the life of me, I can't remember his uh, Macy uh, um, William Macy. Well, uh, William H Macy, who's in uh, two of the movies I cover, Fargo and Magnolia, 
from the 90s. Um, you know, William H. Macy was always great. And also in my book, I interview Alexander Payne, who is the director of the newest Paul Giamatti movie, um, which the name is escaping me, but he was nominated for an Oscar for it. Um, but he's in the book for Election and Citizen Roots. So a lot of these directors are still working. Steven Soderbergh, Quentin Tarantino, Paul Thomas Anderson, Martin Scorsese, Steven Spielberg. I mean, they're still making movies. But I don't know that anyone's taking risks. And that's what I miss, is a risk. Well, and it, it shows you to a degree as well when, you know, the Godzilla movie from Japan is considered a massive success and and it's you know its budget was one tenth of what an American big budget monster movie would be, and its return is a hundredfold compared to what the American versions are. And they're not afraid to go into character development, not just flash bang boom and show people. And you know they showcase a story using the name Godzilla, but building a, an actual deeper personal story behind it i wish companies would start to take that risk again to show that it's okay to have a story be the star of a movie and i like you've mentioned i just don't think that that exists anymore no and you know it's hard to leave our house and it's dangerous to leave our house and the the previews are 45 minutes long and everyone's on their phone and they're talking. I mean, I do have a chapter in the book called How to Watch a Movie 90s Style where I just tell people, put your phone away. You are not going to cry in a movie right. if you have your phone because that's going to bring you back. And it's good to see a movie and cry and feel these things. I mean, Mr. Present. Holland's open. Exactly. That's another great one. Uh, Scott, thank you so much. We'll have a link up and information about your book, The Last Decade of Cinema. Thank you for uh, sitting in and chatting with me for a little bit on this. Well, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate the invite. Thank you very much.